If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. I want to read the first few verses of this chapter, starting with verse 1, just as a backdrop for us. What Paul says here is incredibly sober, and it is so important for the day in which we live to take seriously what he's saying to us here. As I said last night, you can afford to be wrong about a lot of things in the Christian faith. You cannot afford to be wrong about the gospel. And I say that because that's what Paul says. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us out of this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even though we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to that, which we have preached to you, let him be accursed or anathema. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. What, what is Paul's passion here? His passion is a passion for truth. And what he's saying is that if you're going to stand true to the word of God, there are going to be times in your life where you have to stand opposed to men. That cannot be avoided. Talked about the fact that to the Philippian believers, Paul wrote, that they were involved with him in both the confirmation of the gospel as well as the defense of it. If that's true in his day, it's equally true here. It's always been true throughout the age of the church. We have to be equipped not only in a positive sense to know how to share the gospel with men, but also how to defend it from error. And the gospel is in a day of crisis today. Within the evangelical church, we who claim the heritage of the Reformation because, again, as I said last night, we are very close to actually turning our backs on the heritage which we have received. And we need to understand what these errors are that we are faced with. There are two major errors. We're going to deal with one now and one a little bit later this, this afternoon. One is legalism and the other is antinomianism. They're two different errors that relate to the gospel, and they both have to do with the issue of works. One says you can work your way to heaven. The other says you don't need works at all. One says by the grace of God you can earn your salvation. The other says by the grace of God you are freed from works, period. Both are heresies. And we need to understand why. Now, I was raised Roman Catholic. I attended a Benedictine monastery throughout all of my high school years until I was expelled for drinking my senior year. For three and a half years, I attended that school. I was raised in parochial schools prior to that. I implicitly, up to the point that I became probably about 16 years old, I was very devout. When I was a little kid in, in first grade, I used to ride my bike to Mass early in the morning before school ever started got up early, rode my bike a couple of miles that I might go to Mass. I was an altar boy. 
I was very devout, and I implicitly accepted everything that I had been taught by the Roman Catholic Church, but I didn't know Christ because I was not taught the gospel. I was taught church doctrine. I was not taught the gospel. When I was 24, I was gloriously saved. Now, at the time, I was an agnostic. I had turned from Christianity about the time I was 16 years old. I turned completely from Christianity. I embraced agnosticism, and I just went my own way out into the world. And I rebelled against any form of religious authority at all. But when I was 24 years old, the Lord converted me. I heard the gospel. It was through Protestant teachers. And the Lord, just out of his grace, touched my heart, and he brought me to himself. And ever since that day, I have had a passion for the word of God and a passion for the gospel. And I've had a, a particular concern because of my heritage and because of my upbringing and because of my concern for the gospel in a general sense. I'm not just interested in Roman Catholics coming to the Lord. I'm interested in evangelicals coming to the Lord. I'm interested in anyone coming to the Lord. So my interest in the gospel is not just focused on Roman Catholicism. It's focused on a lot of different issues because I care for people. I want them saved because people need to be saved where, no matter what background they're in. And if there's an error there that they have perverted the gospel, they need to understand that. And they need to be trained and instructed in what the truth is so that they can come to know the Lord. And that's my, my real, really my great passion. I, I, I have an interest academically in history, and so I was drawn, you know, for, the, for that particular reason with respect to Roman Catholicism to write issues that relate to history because it impinges on their understanding of the gospel and has an issue to do with authority. If you're the one true church and you can prove that from history, it has an issue, you know, with respect to we are the church, we are the authority, therefore you should listen to what we say. Well, if you can disprove the facts of history, which you can, you can demonstrate to a Roman Catholic that the grounds upon which they rest are false. You can take them to Scripture, and you can show, look, by your own teachings, these are contradictory to the Word of God. About four and a half years ago, a group of leading evangelicals and some Roman Catholics got together and proposed a ceasefire. And their unifying call was for us to come together under a common umbrella of what they call truth. Because what they're saying basically is that though there are significant differences between us, they should not be so significant that they divide us. We should be able to set aside these differences which they consider to be secondary in importance and come together in unity under the name of Christ because we name the name of the same Christ and be able to present to the world a united front so that we can combat these terrible sins which are encroaching upon our culture and destroying it. And, that, you know, there's a lot of appeal to that. I mean, you look around you and you look at the society, it's coming apart at the seams, and you want to you wanna help people, you want to help your culture, you want to help your society. That's, that's very natural to want to do. And it, you can understand the appeal, unfortunately, what they are doing is watering down the major issue of the gospel. What they're saying is that we both believe in the fundamentals of the faith. We both believe, Roman Catholics and Evangelicals, we both believe that we're justified by faith through grace on account of Christ. Okay? That's the terminology that's used. So why can't we get together? The issues that divide us are more semantic they're not really of substance. They're of secondary importance. But I want to tell you, the differences are not semantical. They are substantive. They have eternal consequences to them. And we cannot afford to just turn a blind eye to those differences and say, you know, we're right. We have to come together and fight against abortion and fight against pornography and fight against the immorality and the degradation that's going on all around us. See, as I said last night, the issue is not fighting against those specific evils, as evil as they are, the issue is the gospel. How are you going to fight those prevailing sins? You have to do it with the gospel because you have to deal with men's hearts, and the only thing that can deal with men's hearts is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And if you are diametrically opposed on your understanding of the gospel, you can't exactly come together because you're going to be proclaiming different messages. Because what we're going to see is that even though we both say we are justified by grace through faith on account of Christ, we do not mean the same things by the terms that we use. Because when we say that, we add a little word that the Roman Catholics don't add. Because we say we are justified by grace alone, by faith alone, on account of Christ alone. And that little word alone is all the difference in the world between a gospel that's true and a gospel that is false. We dare not seek to promote unity at the expense of truth because something of far greater importance is at stake than a war in our culture and the disintegration of a culture and that's loyalty to Jesus Christ. Paul warned his Galatian readers of the danger of embracing a false gospel which is the gospel of the Judaizers. And what the Judaizers sought to do was add works to the all-sufficient work of Jesus Christ. That's what the entire epistle of Galatians is dealing with. What's interesting is that the Judaizers were Jews. And they believed in Jesus. Paul and the Judaizers shared a common heritage of truth. But on the essential issue of salvation, they were diametrically opposed to one another. And Paul would have nothing to do with them. He was not an ecumenist. He was just the opposite. There's something of much higher importance to our God, and that's a commitment to unity. Excuse me, it's a commitment to truth. It's not a commitment to unity. The big call in our culture is unity in the evangelical culture, in the Roman Catholic culture. Unity. That's not what is on God's heart as a main priority. His main priority is truth, and out of truth you can build unity. Unity is always built on the foundation of the truth, especially the truth of the gospel. You cannot have biblical unity unless you have biblical truth. We all want unity but not at the expense of truth. Because then you have uniformity, you don't have unity. Men like Chuck Colson are very sincere men. They're also sincerely wrong. You're not called primarily to fight a culture war, we're called to preach the gospel. And the gospel of Roman Catholicism is guilty of perverting and distorting the biblical gospel because the very error of the Judaizers is in principle the same error of Roman Catholicism. Justified by grace through faith on account of Christ. That sounds very orthodox. And it can be if you define your terms correctly. The problem is when you look at how the Roman Catholic Church defines those terms, they do not mean the same thing by the terms that they use that we do. So even though we may use the same terms, we mean different things by them. And that's the subtlety of this. It's not enough to use biblical terms. You have to use them in a biblical way. It is possible to use biblical terms in such a way that the way you define them and the way you use them actually invalidates the actual scriptural meaning of the word. So that what you end up doing is promoting a teaching which is actually contrary to the teaching of scripture even though you're using scriptural terms. I'll give you an historical example. Pelagius was a heretic of the fifth century. He battled with Augustine. And Augustine saw clearly that the teaching of Pelagius was utterly heretical because Pelagius taught there was no such thing as original sin. Man has within himself the ability to work his way to heaven. All he has to do is apply all of his energies and his efforts to doing what God has said to do. <clears throat> and Augustine said he is wrong. 
he is contradicting the word of God and what it teaches about grace. Now what's interesting is Pelagius did not deny grace. Pelagius used the word. And he actually was able to deceive the Bishop of Rome into thinking that he was orthodox because he used orthodox terms without going into an in-depth definition of what he meant by the terms that he used. And so he gave the appearance because he used biblical terms that he was orthodox. But Augustine knew better. And Augustine wrote to the Bishop of Rome along with the bishops of North Africa saying, Sir, you have been deceived. And they refused to comply with what the Bishop of Rome wanted him to do, which was to receive Pelagius as Orthodox. And thankfully, Augustine refused. And because of Augustine and the pressure of those North African bishops, the Bishop of Rome eventually changed his mind. So much for infallibility. So the issue is not that I use biblical terms. You see, when Pelagius used the term grace, what did he mean? Well, it's by the grace of God that you have the example of Jesus Christ. Jesus is your example. Go do what Jesus did. That's grace. By the grace of God, you have a free will. Exercise it. By the grace of God, you have the instruction in the word of God. Here it is. Special revelation given to you. This is grace. The example of all the saints <clears throat> who have gone before. Go do what they've done. Get your act together. Work hard. You'll make your way to heaven. You can do it. That's grace. Now, that isn't what the Bible means by grace. But that's how he defined it. But just don't get into definitions. If you don't get into definitions, you can fool a lot of people. And that is what's at stake here. The issue is not that I use biblical terms. The issue is using them in a way that is consistent with their biblical meaning. It's possible, again, to use biblical terms, but to define them in such a way that you invalidate the very scriptures that you are trying to teach. That is what Roman Catholicism does. It uses biblical terms, but the way it defines them, the content that it gives to the meaning of those words, actually invalidates their scriptural meaning. The key difference is, between Roman Catholicism and the Protestant and biblical teaching on salvation centers around the work of Jesus Christ and how salvation is mediated to man. Now, there are a lot of differences between the Roman Catholic Church and Protestantism. You can get into historical differences. You can get into issues that deal with authority, the whole issue of sola scriptura versus tradition. A lot of different things you can discuss. And they do impinge in some degree on the whole issue of salvation because there's a, there is an authority issue involved. But what I want to focus on here is the issue of the gospel itself. What is salvation from a Roman Catholic perspective? When they use these terms, what do they mean? When Rome says we're saved by faith, oh, everybody thinks that's just so wonderful. What do they mean by that? See, we have a certain understanding of that. They, they bring, you use that word faith, and it's, it's automatic. We take this and overlay our presuppositions on that and our understanding biblically on that, and we say, oh, they agree with us. They do not agree with you. For the Protestant, salvation is Jesus Christ. For the Roman Catholic, salvation ultimately is the church. Jesus Christ is involved, but Jesus Christ is not sufficient. Because it has an inadequate view of the work of Christ, the Roman Catholic Church has an improper view of the biblical meaning of faith, of grace, and of justification. Now, in our last session, remember I said that if you understand the atonement and you understand justification, you're going to have a proper understanding then of what grace means, and you're going to have a proper understanding of what faith means. If you distort your understanding of the work of Christ, you're going to have a distorted view of justification of grace and faith. One flows from the other. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that what the Lord Jesus merited and accomplished on the cross was not a full and finished salvation. 
but what he merited was the grace which God gives to an individual that enables that individual to cooperate with God in atoning for his own sin and in meriting through his own works justification and eternal life. That's a very different view. See, it's by grace. But what is the grace? The grace is what God gives you so you can work and earn your salvation. It's not a finished work of salvation. It's one you have to cooperate with grace to achieve. In Roman Catholic teaching, the work of our Lord is not the exclusive cause of an individual's justification and salvation. Listen to this quote from one of the leading Roman Catholic theologians of this century. His name is Ludwig Ott. And this is what he says about the work of Christ. Christ's redemptive activity finds its apogee in the death of Christ on the cross. On this account, it is by excellence, but not exclusively, the efficient cause of our redemption. No one can be just to whom the merits of Christ's passion have not been communicated. Salvation can be acquired only by the grace merited by Christ. What did Christ merit on the cross? Was it a completed, finished salvation? No. That is not the exclusive basis upon which I'm saved. What he merited was grace. That's a very important distinction. Because in Roman Catholic theology, what saves me is sanctifying grace, which is mediated from Christ through the church and its sacraments and its priesthood to the individual and it is through that grace then that I am enabled and empowered to live a life of works which merit my eternal life. Christ's work is not sufficient. It is not a full satisfaction to God in bearing his wrath and judgment against sin. It is not that. There's a recent book that's come out by a Roman Catholic apologist named Robert Genus. It's called Not by Faith Alone. I want you to listen very carefully. This is a rather extended quote, but I think it's important because this is a popularized view on a lay level of what Roman Catholic teaching is. And it's pretty clear. This is what St. Genus says. What did Christ's suffering and death actually accomplish that allowed the Father to provide the human race with salvation? Did Christ take within himself the sin and guilt of mankind and suffer the specific punishment for that sin and guilt as Protestants contend? The answer is no. Christ did not take upon himself the entire punishment required of man for sin. Scripture teaches only that Christ became a propitiation, a sin offering, or a sacrifice for sins. Essentially, this means that Christ, because he was guiltless, sin-free, and in favor with God, could offer himself up as a means of persuading God to relent of his angry wrath against the sins of mankind. Sin destroys God's creation. God, who is a passionate and sensitive being, is angry against man for harming the creation. God is personally offended by sin, and thus he needs to be personally appeased in order to offer a personal forgiveness. In keeping with his divine principles, his personal nature, and the magnitude of the sins of man, the only thing God would allow to appease him was the suffering and death of the sinless representative of mankind, namely Christ. A great satisfaction was necessary, since man had sinned against a great and holy God. In his mediatorial role, Christ, living a sinless life and dying a perfect death, obtains favor from God so that he can approach him and beseech him for mercy and forgiveness on behalf of sinful man. God is not required to offer forgiveness, yet Christ pleads and appeals to the intrinsic love and long-suffering of God. Christ is the obedient Son who sacrifices himself, intercedes to obtain the mercy of the Father, and to abate his anger. Now, according to St. Janus, Christ is not bearing away God's judgment and wrath against sin to fully satisfy the justice and the law of God. 
He is simply offering a means to appease God. To appease his personal anger because he's angry with us because we've harmed his creation. And he's going to appease God through the offering of himself so that God will relent of his unwillingness to forgive us and he will withdraw from his anger and out of his goodness because Christ has made this offer. He'll offer us a salvation so we can save ourselves. He first personally has to be appeased so he will be persuaded to offer grace to man and make a way of forgiveness for us. That hardly is in line with what Scripture teaches about Christ becoming a propitiation because he is becoming a propitiation for our sins, the totality of them, not just for the fact that we've offended God because we've harmed his creation. God does not have to be appeased by Christ and pled with by Christ to offer salvation to men. Jesus Christ came because God sent him. He comes from the heart of God, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. He's not reluctant. God, out of his passionate heart of love for us, sent Jesus. And Jesus willingly came out of a love to give himself to satisfy God's wrath against us for the totality of our sin. And he has fully satisfied the wrath of God against sin as our substitute. And on the basis of that sacrifice, he can offer us a full and a complete salvation, total deliverance from all condemnation and judgment. But you see, according to Roman Catholic theology, Christ did not accomplish a full, finished, and completed salvation in his work of atonement. His death on the cross merely merited grace from God, which can then be channeled to us through supposedly the Roman Catholic Church and its sacraments. Grace is not the activity of God in Christ purchasing and accomplishing salvation and eternal life and applying this as a gift to man. It's not a completed work. Grace is a supernatural quality that is infused in the soul of a man or a woman through the sacraments enabling that individual to do works of expiation and works of righteousness. Which then become the basis of our salvation. Man's works must be added, in other words, to the work of Jesus Christ. There's something else that needs to be done in addition to the work of Christ. And in particular, what is necessary is the work of the sacraments. So justification then is not a once for all declaration of righteousness that's based on the imputed righteousness of Jesus, but a process that is dependent upon the righteousness of man produced through infused grace. Now what to, how more contradictory can you get than the conception that I am justified by God through the once for all atonement of Christ through the imputed righteousness of his son given to me as a gift, which means I don't have to do anything to achieve because God in his grace has done it all for me as opposed to saying well what grace means is that God in his mercy is going to give you the ability to merit it yourself because the work of the Lord Jesus is insufficient in Roman Catholic teaching there is no salvation apart from participation in its sacraments through its priesthood and in fact, the Church of Rome teaches that it is the mediator between Christ and the individual. The church is essential for salvation because you cannot receive grace which will save you except through the sacraments. And those sacraments have to be Roman Catholic sacraments because the priesthood has been established as a mediator between Christ and man. You cannot receive salvation directly from the Lord Jesus Christ through a personal relationship. To teach that, that you can actually come in a direct way, in a personal way, to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved without the mediation of the church is a grave error. 
according to Rome. Well, you, you see, you can see, if, if all of your salvation is tied up in an institution, and the institution really believes this, you can see why the teaching of the biblical gospel would be such an offense. It's such a, just something that would incense people. And during the days of the Reformation, I mean, you can imagine the hold on men if what they are teaching is so utterly contrary to Scripture and suddenly they are confronted with the fact, I don't need this, that institution falls to the ground. Because the whole basis upon which it is, is grounded is a misrepresentation of what Scripture teaches. Robertson Janus says this about the church. Although Protestantism understands the church to be God-ordained and helpful, it also believes that the institutional church is not an absolute necessity in order to know God or to receive his grace. Protestantism at the Reformation had to formulate how the infinite God came directly into the life of the individual, a formulation not dependent on the mediation of the church's eons of tradition, teaching, authority, and sacraments. See, Protestantism is supposedly an error because the church's mediation is necessary for salvation. And what we're saying is, no. You can come directly to Jesus Christ in a personal way and experience salvation without the mediation of any other person or institution or work. That is so liberating. One of the leading Roman Catholic theologians of this day is a man named John Harden. He's written a catechism which carries the official authorization of the Vatican. This is what he says about the church, the Roman Catholic Church. He asked this question, why did Christ establish the church? And this is his answer. Christ established the church as the universal sacrament of salvation in that she is the divinely instituted means of, confirming, of conferring grace on all the members of the human family. She believes it is God's will that no one is forgiven except through the merits of Jesus Christ and that these merits are uniquely channeled through the church he founded. The church communicates the merits of Christ's mercy to sinners through the mass and the sacraments and all the prayers and good works of the faithful. According to the way God has willed that we be saved, the sacraments are necessary for salvation. So according to the Roman Catholic teaching, apart from the Church of Rome and its sacraments, there is no salvation. The Council of Trent made that very clear. It said, if anyone says the sacraments are not necessary for salvation and that without them or without the desire for them, men obtain from God through faith alone the grace of justification, let him be anathema. I don't know how much clearer you can be. You need the church. Now the reason the sacraments are necessary is because the atonement of Jesus is not sufficient to deal with sin. In Roman Catholic theology, there are three main sacraments that are necessary for justification and ultimate salvation. Those are baptism, confession and penance, and the Eucharist. And in the Eucharist, there's the whole concept of the Mass. In water baptism, an individual is brought into a state of regeneration and sanctifying grace, according to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. An infant that is baptized is regenerated through water baptism and is made a child of God and infused with sanctifying grace. An adult who comes into the church who has repented of sin and who has embraced by faith what the Catholic Church teaches and is baptized is regenerated. It is through water baptism that that is conferred. The guilt and the punishment for original sin and for all sins committed up to the point of baptism are washed away in baptism and are forgiven. Sins committed after baptism must be dealt with through the sacraments of penance and the mass. Now that's especially true for mortal sin. And of course there's this distinction in Roman Catholicism between venial sin and mortal sin. Mortal sin kills the soul. It causes a loss of sanctifying grace. And if you die in a state of mortal sin, you will go to hell. Venial sin will put you in purgatory. Nonetheless, what you have to do to deal with these specific sins 
is go through the sacrament of penance and confession in order to regain that state of grace and really in order to maintain a state of grace, of sanctifying grace before God and therefore to maintain your status of justification because you can lose your justification. You lose sanctifying grace through sin, you lose your justification and it has to be regained. And in order to regain the state of grace and salvation, an individual must participate in the sacraments. Council of Trent declared that no one could be justified who sins after baptism apart from the Roman Catholic sacrament of penance. It said, if anyone says that he who has fallen after baptism is able to recover the justice which he has lost apart from the sacrament of penance, let him be anathema. You see, the, the reformers are saying these sacraments are not necessary for your justification because only the atonement is necessary. And the Roman Catholic Church is saying, you're anathema because you're teaching heresy. The church is necessary. This is God's means of communicating to you the grace of salvation. Now, in the sacrament of penance, an individual is required to confess his sin to a Roman Catholic priest and to receive absolution and then to perform a prescribed penance as a means of expiation. So when the priest, when you go through the priest, you go through the whole issue of confession, you confess your sins, he judiciously, judicially, as a judge, declares you to be forgiven, absolved of your sin, but you're still required to do a work of penance. And that work of penance is a means of expiating your sin. John Harden puts it this way. Penance is necessary because we must expiate and make reparation for the punishment which is due our sins. We make satisfaction for our sins by every good act we perform in a state of grace, but especially by prayer, penance, and the practice of charity. Now, if the work of Jesus Christ is sufficient as an atonement for my sin, I don't need to supplement his work with a work of my own to make satisfaction before God for the punishment that is due my sin. You see the, the denigration here of the work of the Lord Jesus. What he's saying is that you've got to add your work to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ to make satisfaction for your sin. So it's clear then that men must supplement the work of Christ for sins committed after baptism by partially atoning and expiating their own sins through penance. In addition to penance, the Church of Rome also teaches the necessity for the Mass as an expiation for sins. In the sacrament of the Eucharist, the elements of bread and wine are literally transformed, supposedly, into the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Literally, physically, it's a miracle which they believe takes place. Christ is physically present and he is then offered as a propitiatory sacrifice on the Roman Catholic altar. Now that's nothing less than the ongoing re-sacrifice of Jesus Christ as a propitiation for sin. Now I get all kinds of grief from Roman Catholics on this one. You are misrepresenting what we teach. We're not teaching it's a renewed sacrifice. It's the same sacrifice as Calvary. Folks, the sacrifice of Calvary, number one, was bloody. Number two, there's a death that takes place. It cannot be the same sacrifice as Calvary because Calvary stopped. It ended. Listen to these words by John Harden. The sacrifice of the altar... Christ, the eternal high priest, in an unbloody way, offers himself a most acceptable victim to the eternal father, just as he did on the cross. In the mass, no less than on Calvary, Jesus really offers his life to his heavenly father. The mass, therefore, no less than the cross, is expiatory for sin. That takes my breath away. I mean, I am not misrepresenting Roman Catholicism. They don't want to face up to what they're teaching. This is a re-sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
Now, it is not propitiatory. It cannot be propitiatory. It's a blatant contradiction to the teaching of Scripture. They are teaching that the sacrifice of Christ can be perpetuated through time. Remember the once for all phrase that was used? Once for all means it is ended. It is not perpetuated through time. It is a historic space-time event that is finished. Just like the birth of Christ. The birth of Christ cannot be perpetuated through time. It ended. It's an historic event. His resurrection is an historic event. He isn't going to go back into the grave and be resurrected again. His crucifixion is an historic event that is finished. It's a completed, finished work. In Roman Catholic theology, the work of Christ is not finished. It's ongoing. Because the work of the cross was not sufficient, it must be supplemented by the sacrament, which supposedly perpetuates the sacrifice the Word of God teaches that our Lord has made a complete propitiation for sin. We saw that in the book of Romans and Hebrews, the scripture teaches that his sacrifice, the offering of his body, right? And his death all come together to complete what is called the sacrifice or the propitiation. What are they doing? in the offering of the Mass. Are they not offering Christ's body? What does Scripture say? His body could be offered once for all. And you'll say to them, can he die? No, 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 no. No, he cannot die. We're not teaching that he dies. And why do you teach that he can be offered again? See, the... The fact is, Christ cannot die again. His body cannot be offered again. His sacrifice cannot be offered again. There's no more sacrifice for sin. So the, bat, so the Mass then cannot legitimately be called a perpetuation and a renewing of Christ's sacrifice because it's over. Christ does not die in the Mass. Therefore, this so-called sacrifice is not a propitiatory sacrifice because what makes it a propitiation is his death. So the fact that they call it a propitiation is an utter denial of Scripture because it's only by death. Apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. What is this sacrifice? It's unbloody. It cannot be a sacrifice for sin. And it's not, you know, Hardin talks about he offers his life to the Father. Jesus didn't offer his life to the Father. He laid his life down in death to the Father. And it's that sacrifice that was accepted for our sin. It's not just the offering up of his life that's accepted for the Father as an expiation for sin. It's the laying down of that life and death. And of course, Christ can never die again. So if you suggest then that a sacrament is necessary to continue to offer Christ's body and blood to make sacrifice for sin, it's a teaching that is completely antithetical to Scripture. It undermines the sufficiency of Christ's work of atonement. It distorts the truth of the gospel by positing a way of salvation that is condemned in Scripture, which is you're adding to the sufficiency of the work of Christ. It's the Galatian error. That fundamental understanding of the atonement of Jesus as a once-for-all work is foundational for properly interpreting the other passages of Scripture, such as the Lord's Supper. What is the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper is referred to in Scripture as a memorial. It's a remembrance of Christ's sacrifice, of the deliverance that has been once for all achieved by him on our behalf. It's a once for all act. And the Lord's Supper is a remembrance. It's a rem memorial. It's, it's not a reenactment. It's not a perpetuation of what he's done. It's a remembrance of what he's done. You know, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> the Lord established the Passover feast as a way of remembering year by year the deliverance that God brought for his people when he brought them out of Egypt. But it's a memorial sacrifice. You know, the Lord's Supper was done at Passover. It's the reinstituting in a New Testament way what the Passover meant to the Jews. That supper to us is a memorial of the once-for-all deliverance that we've experienced in Jesus Christ for our salvation. 
It's not a renewing of that sacrifice, it's a remembrance of it, a commemoration. Remember Paul's word in Colossians 1 where he says, I do my utmost to fill up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ? You know, Roman Catholic says, well, you see, see, the sufferings of Jesus are lacking. See, there's more to be done. Well, you have to interpret Scripture by Scripture. You don't rip out a passage and just assign it any meaning you want to, to give to it. What Scripture teaches in Hebrews and in Galatians and in Romans is that it's a once-for-all work that he's accomplished. There's no more sacrifice for sin. So whatever it means about suffering here, it has nothing to do with Christ's expiation for sin. That's complete. Now, I personally believe that what this means, there are a couple of means you could put to this. This is what I believe. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh. I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. What does Paul mean? Paul, what's Paul suffering for? He's suffering for the gospel. He's out there, he's being put in prison, he's being hounded by the authorities. He eventually loses his life. He is suffering to take the gospel to lost men and women. What's lacking in the suffering of Christ? Who did Christ suffer for? He suffered for men. And what's he out there doing? He's out there trying to fill up the body of Christ, which is bringing people into the kingdom. What's lacking in Christ's sufferings? Those for whom Christ died. And that's what he's seeking to fill up by his sufferings. Christ's sufferings are not insufficient with respect to our sin. That is clear from the other passages of Scripture. What about John 6? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You would think, doesn't that justify the Roman Catholic teaching of the Eucharist and the Mass? Well, Jesus is referring here to spiritually appropriating his person and his work into one's life. And he equates eating and drinking with faith, with believing. So that when I come to him as the all-sufficient Savior, I'm receiving him into my life. And he equates that to actually assimilating, as you would assimilate food. You assimilate his person into your life, and you partake of that work that he has accomplished. He is not speaking literally, but spiritually and figuratively. Now, I love the way Augustine interprets John 6. Listen to the words of this Roman Catholic church father. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, says Christ, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This seems to be enjoining a crime or a vice. It is therefore a figure. He means that it is figurative, not literal. It is a figure enjoining that we should have a share in the sufferings of our Lord and that we should retain a sweet and profitable memory of the fact that his flesh was wounded and crucified for us. In other words, Christ is speaking in spiritual terms about his atonement. And that's how he interprets John 6. In fact, in one of his sermons, Augustine refers to the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost and he says that when those, those 3,000 believed, he says they ate the flesh of Christ and drank his blood. It had nothing to do with the sacrament. When they believed the gospel, Augustine interpreted that to mean they ate Christ's flesh and they drank his blood because they participated in the benefits of his work by appropriating him. Augustine interpreted that passage figuratively, not literally. In addition to penance and the Mass, the Roman Catholic Church also teaches that sin can be further expiated through the sufferings of purgatory after one dies, and also through indulgences. It may surprise you to know that the Roman Catholic Church still teaches indulgences. The abuses were dealt with, for the most part, after Trent. But the Catholic Church still officially teaches a doctrine of indulgences, just as it did in the days of the Reformation. So through its doctrines of confession and penance, the Mass, purgatory, and indulgences, the Roman Catholic Church adds sacramental and moral works to the work of Jesus Christ. Justification and salvation are not through Christ alone, 
but are instead a cooperative effort between Christ and man. Man must first perform the works of penance as a supplement to the work of Christ to atone for sin. And man must do works in a state of grace in order to merit justification and eternal life. Again, the Roman Catholic Church uses biblical terms like justification and grace, but the interpretation that it gives to those terms and what they mean actually undermines their biblical meaning. When Scripture says that we are justified by grace on account of Christ, it means on account of Christ exclusively. Completely apart from the work of man or sacraments. When the Roman Catholic Church says that an individual is justified by grace, again she means grace infused into the soul of man, which enables that individual to do their own works of righteousness. And it's those works that then become the basis of their justification. So how, there again we come back to, what do you mean by the righteousness of God that justifies you? When the Roman Catholic Church takes that term and interprets it, what it means, God gives you grace as a gift. And the works that you do in a state of grace can be called the righteousness of God. They're actually your works. That isn't what the righteousness of God means out of Romans. Righteousness of God in Romans is the Lord Jesus Christ in his act of obedience, his work, Satisfying God completely and totally for our sin. That's what's imputed to us. Besides, the righteousness of God is apart from works, isn't it? Given to the ungodly, given by faith. In Roman Catholic theology, it is the works of man cooperating with God's grace. Not apart from works. It's part and parcel with works. It's just a flat contradiction of what the Word of God teaches. What does God require? Perfection. Is any work of yours, even in grace, going to be done in perfection? Absolutely not. Titus says, it is not by works which we have done in righteousness. How do you do a work in righteousness? It's by grace. See, not even grace-empowered works are the basis upon which you're saved but by Jesus Christ alone. Justification in Roman, theology, in Roman theology is a process. It's not a once for all finished work. It's not a declaration of righteousness. It's an infusion which enables man to be something before God to merit his own way. In Canon 10 on justification, the Council of Trent has explicitly condemned the Protestant teaching of imputed righteousness. That's very important. So when you talk about Roman Catholicism and its, its desire to come together in ecumenism with Protestantism, they don't ever want to talk about the fact that Trent officially condemned the very basis upon which the gospel is grounded, which is the imputed righteousness of Christ. This is what Trent says. If anyone says that it is by Christ's justice or righteousness itself that they are formally just, let him be anathema. Trent teaches that men are justified by the righteousness of Christ only in the sense that in his atonement Jesus merited the grace which is infused in man for salvation channeled through the sacraments. The Roman Catholic theology as human works which are the basis for justification which merit eternal life. And Trent goes on to talk about the fact that our good works justify us before God and merit eternal life. John Harden says, Sanctifying grace is a supernatural quality that dwells in the human soul by which a person is able to perform actions meriting eternal life. You're able to perform actions which merit eternal life. Protestant teaching has been soundly condemned 
by the official dogma of Roman Catholicism. In Roman Catholic teaching, justification is not by grace alone in the biblical sense. It's not on account of Christ alone in the biblical sense. As John Gerstner put it, the Protestant trusts Christ to save him. The Roman Catholic trusts Christ to help him save himself. I like that. It is faith versus works. And he's right. The Protestant affirms the biblical teaching of sola fide, faith alone, because justification is by Christ alone. It's by his righteousness alone. He is a sufficient savior. And our works contribute nothing to our salvation. Works are the fruit of salvation that must always exist. But works as a merit for salvation must be repudiated. But the Roman Catholic Church has to repudiate the whole notion of sola fide because of its system, because of its understanding of the work of Christ. It's not sufficient. If you ask a Roman Catholic what is saving faith, and if they are a very sincere and well-instructed Roman Catholic, what they're going to tell you is that saving faith is called dogmatic faith. That is, that it has to do with the doctrinal content of the faith that's necessary for salvation in Roman Catholicism. It's not simply trust in Christ. What is necessary to be believed is everything that the church teaches dogmatically. In order to be saved, an individual cannot believe and hold to doctrines which contradict the church. If the church has dogmatically defined something to be necessary for salvation, you must believe it. Now that entails the teaching of the creed, the church's teaching on the sacraments, on works, on justification. But it also includes the teachings of papal rule and papal infallibility and the Marian dogmas of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption of Mary. You must embrace those teachings if you're going to be justified before God. You reject anything officially taught by the Roman Catholic Church. You reject saving faith. You forfeit justification and eternal life. Because saving faith means dogmatic faith. Both Trent and Vatican I said that if anyone rejects the teachings of these councils, they cannot be justified. Lubicott put it very succinctly in this way. He said, as far as the content of justifying faith is concerned, the so-called fiducial faith does not suffice. What is demanded is the theological or dogmatic faith. Vatican I said, this is the teaching of Catholic truth from which no one can deviate without loss of faith and salvation. And it's talking about the papacy. It's teaching on papal rule and papal infallibility. This is the teaching of Catholic truth from which no one can deviate without loss of faith and salvation. If you want justifying faith, you must accept what we're saying here about the papacy. You must believe papal infallibility. You must submit yourself to the Bishop of Rome. So for a Roman Catholic, his faith is ultimately in a church. It's the church which is the means of salvation. Christ is in the background. The church is in the forefront. It's not a direct personal mediation of salvation between myself and Christ. There has to be other mediators. The Roman Catholic Church has distorted the gospel of grace. It has done so by adding to the sufficiency of the work of Christ the necessity for priests as mediators, the necessity for ongoing sacrifices, the necessity for human works and sacraments. It's done it by explicitly denying faith alone and condemning the teaching of Christ's imputed righteousness alone for justification. It has condemned that. It's done it by denying that the atonement has dealt with the totality of God's judgment due to sin. It's done it by making justification and sanctification interchangeable terms. And in so doing, it distorts their biblical meaning and promotes the gospel of legalism. What it says is when, when the scriptures teach sanctification, it means justification. Two terms really are the same. 
They're not two separate works, they're the same work, just different terms meaning the same thing. So sanctification is a process of where the Lord is changing my life and I'm working. And what they're saying is that that is justification. That's not what the Bible means. That's what Rome means. It does this by adding doctrines which the church says are necessary for salvation but are not taught in scripture and were never taught in the history of the early church, such as papal infallibility, the Assumption of Mary, the Immaculate Conception of Mary. The Roman Catholic Church has fallen into the same error in principle that the Judaizers have done. The you know, Roman Catholic Church says we believe in Christ. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's done a work of salvation, but it isn't sufficient. You have to add what? You have to have sacrifices. You've got to have priests. Because what we're adding to it is Judaism. Paul fights that error. The devil just waits a while and he brings it in in different clothing. Oh yes, we believe in Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah, but you need priests. You need sacrifices. He's not enough. That's a distortion of the gospel. You don't need any other mediator. You don't need a church. You don't need priests. You don't need Mary. You need Jesus. You need the gospel. That needs to be mediated by the Spirit of God to the hearts of men. But it's a direct, personal application of salvation between a soul and the Lord Jesus Christ, independent of anything else. And it's eternal, and it is finished, and it is complete. Because it's his righteousness imputed, not mine, worked for. The biblical gospel is Christ alone. It exalts Jesus. What does this other do? It exalts a church. It exalts man. It exalts man's works in the name of God. It's anathema. Well, what about James 2? What about where James says, Abraham was justified by works, not by faith alone? Now, doesn't that prove the Roman Catholic position? That we're justified by works and that the teaching of faith alone is actually a perversion of what the Bible means. Well, in that passage, James is dealing with the nature of saving faith. Okay? Let's establish that from the very beginning. What he's talking about is what is faith? If a man says he has faith but he has no works, can that faith save him? That's what he's dealing with. The nature of justification is dealt with by Paul in his treatise in Romans and in Galatians. It's Paul who has given us the systematic teaching on the nature of justification, and therefore James must be interpreted in the light of Paul's teaching. And Paul is absolutely emphatic. Justification is not by works. It is not by works. Well, then how do you reconcile James and Paul? James is not teaching that justification is based on human works. He teaches that it is faith that saves. It's faith that justifies. But it is a certain kind of faith. It is a faith that works. He's dealing with the issue of dead faith. What we would call today easy believism. Dead orthodoxy. Intellectual assent. It's a faith that makes a profession... But the life is void of works, it's void of holiness, it's void of real love. It's dead. It's an intellectual thing. And there are people like that. They view Christianity as a system of doctrine, and the ascent to that system of doctrine, it's basically a philosophy. But that's all it is. It's not a relationship. key phrase in James is show me your faith. The only way true saving faith is demonstrated is through the evidence of works. That's what James is saying. Show me your faith without the works. I'll show you my faith by my works. 
James is talking here about an outward testimony to an inward reality. A testimony to men that goes beyond a mere profession of words. Show me your faith. Show me, a man. Show me your faith. How do I know you have real faith? It'll be demonstrated in your life by how you live. James is saying, how can you say you have a faith that is saving if you have no works that manifest the reality of that faith? Now Paul uses Abraham as an example, just like James does. But Paul uses Abraham as an example of a man who was justified by faith completely apart from works in Romans 4. But the faith that resulted in his justification also resulted in works in his life. And that's what James is saying. This man who was justified by faith demonstrates he has saving faith by the fact that he worked. And he did something that demonstrated his love for God, which is the fruit of his faith. His works justified his faith and vindicated his faith before men and before us who read of his life. His faith bore the fruit of love for God, and in that sense, his works justified him. They justified his faith, if you will. Let me just give you an example. Matthew eleven nineteen says, wisdom is justified by her works. All right. some, some of the Bibles say wisdom is vindicated by her works. And the word vindicated there is the word for justify. Wisdom is justified by our works. What does that mean? It simply means that wisdom is vindicated as true wisdom by the evidence of its works. The works don't make it wisdom. The wisdom exists. It's there. But it is manifested by the works. It reveals its existence. It's the same with saving faith. Justification and faith already exist but the reality of saving faith that justifies is always evidenced by works because it evidences a relationship with Christ. In the dictionary of New Testament theology, Colin Brown puts it this way. He says, in the expression, faith working through love, which is in Galatians 5, 6, love is specified as the means by which faith becomes visibly operative or effective. How do I know I have faith? It expresses itself in the way I live. So Abraham was not justified by faith alone. That is, by a faith that is alone, but by works. That is, by a faith that works. In other words, what James is saying is that sanctification cannot be separated from justification. The person who is justified is also sanctified. Because when you are united to Christ, there are two wonderful blessings that come to you. You are set free forever from the guilt of your sin and from hell by the imputed righteousness of Christ. And you are set free from bondage to sin in, in a practical way in your life. And as a result of that union with Christ, you begin to be energized by the Spirit of God to live a life of sanctification. And it's fruit. It's a fruit of the relationship. So that's why you can simultaneously be justified apart from works and yet manifest works because of the relationship. That What is the codifying truth that brings everything together at union with Jesus? When a man is saved, he is eternally justified but he's also regenerated, sanctified, and adopted into the family of God. But again, as we said earlier, the works of sanctification are not the basis for justification. Justification is a separate work in its own right. Sanctification is a separate work in its own right. Regeneration is a separate work in its own right. You don't confuse the terms. They're not interchangeable terms. And if a person is not being sanctified, they have never been justified okay let me say that again if a person is not being sanctified they've never been justified because they have never come to know Jesus Christ to teach that we are justified by faith alone 
does not deny the necessity for the works of sanctification. It simply safeguards the truth of justification as an exclusive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the wonder of the Protestant Reformation is that it affirmed two basic things. Imputed righteousness for justification, which gives me an eternal standing before God for, forever, and the truth of sanctification out of union with Christ. The Roman Catholic Church explicitly condemns the biblical teaching of imputed righteousness for justification. And it collapses sanctification into the biblical teaching of justification and in so doing completely invalidates the biblical teaching of that wonderful truth. And it ultimately makes salvation a work of man. What John Gershner said is absolutely true. The Protestant teaching is biblical. The Protestant looks to Jesus to save him, period. The Roman Catholic looks to Jesus to help him save himself. It is works versus grace. And it's just that simple. So we can't be confused by biblical terms. We have to understand what those terms mean. And we have to go to the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church itself to determine what they mean by the terms that they use. And when we do that, and we compare them to Scripture and to the biblical gospel, we find very clearly that the Roman Catholic Church has in fact perverted the gospel of grace. It has distorted that gospel. And it makes it a works merit system exalts man and denigrates Christ. It is wrong. We are justified by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our C Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.